Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the new updated RS wheel from the guys at Moza Racing. They are calling it the RS version 2, adding some customizable LED backlit buttons to basically the same layout and configuration as the first version of the RS wheel. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Let's take a closer look at this version 2 of the RS wheel from the guys at Moza Racing. First off, they've made some changes and they've left some things alone, which is probably a wise thing to do when you're messing with a wheel that pretty much gets it done as it is, but they're just improving the product as it goes along like most manufacturers will do. It's still 330 millimeters as far as diameter, just like the old version 1 over here. I'm calling it the old one now. <laughs> and this one is the same rim as far as the shape of it. The finish on the rim is exactly the same as the version 1, so I'm assuming it's the same one. Again, this one is in leather. This one over here was in Alcantara. So, good grip. It feels pretty good in the hand. It's got thumb rest on it. It's got little places for your fingers to go, notches in the back. So when you wrap your hands around that, it gives you a pretty secure grip. I'm not a big fan of leather, unless it's going to be... Well, we let a lot of people use your, letting other people use your rig a lot or your driving position a lot because it's easy to maintain. The Alcantara and the Suede's are better in the feel for me. Of course, that's subjective at the end of the day. But yeah, it still gets the job done. Leather is, is less maintenance, though. It's less worry. So I kind of like it for that. But when you get real sweaty and long stints, sometimes it can get slippery depending on the type of leather it is. Stitching looks good on this. Can't find any defects anywhere. Pretty smooth everywhere I look. I think all of the wheels that I've gotten from Moses so far and reviewed, you know, they're just good looking wheels right out of the box. They do a professional job on the fit and finish. Everything looks good from the outside as far as the physical part of it. I don't find any defects anywhere, although I'll keep looking as we go through the review. So, 330 millimeter wheel, which is good for oval and rally and things like that. I don't like using these kind of wheels in GT, although you can use it for anything you want, obviously. Depends on what you want to do. But yeah, it's a hefty wheel, but it has a big NRG style quick release, and that's what all of the Moza wheels have because of the wheelbase system they have over here for that hub. And it gives it some weight that normally wouldn't be there because it's a pretty big honking piece of metal there. As far as the type of quick release, it's the same. We've got six balls on the front, or top rather, and four on the bottom. Same we have over here. Even the disc one here are the same. One's black though. This is the black scheme and this has got the gold and the colors. And this looks like well, it's a lot more colorful mainly because of the buttons. It also has the forged carbon fiber over there. We also have that here. Now we've replaced that gold ring that has the horn button in it, which is actually a functional button by the way. Now we don't have that anymore. We've got this flat plate, which I kind of like a little better. And it is the forged carbon fiber. Some like this, some don't. It has a kind of a 3D effect in the lights. It's kind of neat. Clean looking. Everything is etched on properly. I can't find any defects on what they've done here. And of course, we also have that forged carbon fiber piece that's sitting in the aluminum housing. It's actually where the button plate electronics are sitting. Now, the layout is pretty much the same too. But we've got these black buttons, but they're not black buttons. Well, they are black buttons, but they're lit buttons. And we won't be able to see that until we attach it to the motor because that's where it gets its power from the front here. So we'll see that once we get there and we have the software open and messing around with different adjustments we can make on the buttons. So we've got three buttons down here and these are LED. And by the way, you can change the colors on these LEDs too. We have rotaries. We also had rotaries there on the version one. It had a different handle on it though. And this kind of and it was a push button. Good tactile feedback on this. Good detent spacing. I didn't have any complaints about these, I don't think, when I did the review, because they just, they worked well. And you can go up and grab two real quick and know that you got two. And you can probably hear that. If you can usually hear the detents, they're good detents when you feel them, when you're turning them. Well, we still have a rotary up here, and it's programmable. But now we've got a plastic knob on here. I believe those were aluminum. They sure felt like it. But now they're plastic, nothing fancy there. But still, the notches are very good on this. 
I think it's a little louder on the other one because the aluminum handles on it transfer the sound better. But this plastic kind of mutes it a bit. And it is a push button, just like that one is. So it's the same physical characteristics here, but just looks different because of the different thing that they put on here for the knob, little plastic piece. And again, these are easy to grab a couple of quick detents and come back because the detents have good spacing, at least for my use. And everybody's a little different. It's kind of subjective when you get this stuff. So yeah, it depends on what you like, but I don't have a problem with these. I'd like to see aluminum on here maybe, but other than that, you know, it gets the job done. So we've got three functions for each one of these, a push button and left or right. And depending on what function we assign to the rotary or encoder, whatever you want to call this thing. What else we got? We got two more buttons up here, just like the other one. The fact the top is exactly the same, but now we've got our LED buttons up here and we still have these joysticks up here. And the joysticks have five moves. We've got a left and a right. We've got an up and a down. And we've got a push button. But you can't turn it, so there's no rotary function here or encoder function. So it's still five moves there. And of course, we have these buttons up here. Now, the buttons themselves feel pretty much the same as the buttons over there. Nothing to write home about. No, not a lot of tactile feedback or anything. But it gets the job done. It is a, a decent stop. You know you pressed it because you can feel the stop. It's not a real stiff hard stop but still it's something I like to feel a little bit more tactile feedback when I hit a button but I'm sure it gets the job done just like the other ones did going around the back we have an aluminum housing here we have some holes in there could be for cooling the version one housing over there has the same hole patterns on it those holes you can see where the wireless connection is remember we get power for the wheel from here but the communication for the buttons and the clutches and the shifters and things, all those inputs come over a wireless signal, right? It's for power. So if you look in this one, and I showed this in the review, I'm pretty sure, even when I took it apart and showed you the look inside, there is, I think you see the circuit board there for the transceiver. And you see those traces in there? They're kind of squared off there. They, okay, that's the antenna that's actually embedded the traces of an antenna embedded into the transceiver itself. But Moza went the extra step and actually soldered in a antenna wire, two wire antenna wire, and then ran that down to this plastic window down here and taped it to that plastic window to give it a more redundant signal path. Make it more effective in the long run instead of just having it going through these holes here. Now here, they've gotten rid of that. Well, they haven't gotten rid of it, but you can't see it in there anymore. So it's gone. And they've moved the window. And now it's not shiny plastic, kind of a matte looking plastic there. No more window on the bottom. So a couple changes there are noticeable. And also for the electrical transfer, I don't know if you guys have seen, noticed this yet, but this actually has a vertical six pin configuration along with the original horizontal five pin configuration. And these are spring loaded electrical contact pins. So when we put this on the wheel, it makes contact and keeps contact with our pads over here that are transferring the power. I'll show you this one over here again. We had five there. Now the extra pins, probably for extra features coming in the future and power transfer. I did a review on their FSR formula wheel and it had the same configuration in it. But of course that wheel was sporting a 4.3 inch digital display on it. So that would take more power than just buttons, lighting up buttons like this one does. And of course the RPM indicator up there. So more power, more current. So yeah, having more contact area on those pads here that are transferring the power would probably be a good idea for that kind of thing. And of course, just make them all the same. So you don't have to pick and choose which of these assemblies you're putting on a wheel. They all do the same thing, depending on the circuit board configuration back here on the button plate. And if you have a display or you don't, that kind of thing. What else we talk about here? The shifters. They have a good feel to them. Magnetic. I always like magnetic shifters. They have a little bit of bendiness to them. Watch that there. But they're pretty far out here. Uh, let's see. There we go. I can kind of push it there. It's a little. It's hard to really illustrate this in video, but there's a little bit of bendiness to it. Nothing offensive. In fact, it's just a, not as crisp as I would like it to be, but that's personal preference, obviously. So it depends on what you like. But yeah, it gets the job done. It's got a crisp feel to it, good tactile feel, but 
you know when you made a shift on these. There's no question, and that's the important part. These are all one-piece housings here for the shifter and clutch panels. Of course, that's the clutch down there on the bottom. All, all sensor setups, so contactless, if you will, for the mechanism, so it should give it longer life cycle. The clutches down here, they can be programmed to do different things. We can have it in a, a dual clutch mode where we snap one off for the quick takeoff and then we bring it in the other one and let it slowly out like on a motorcycle to get it fully engaged on the clutch and fully pulling the tires like we should. So it gives you that quick takeoff when you snap that out and it's not spinning the tires but you're moving forward and then you can regulate it better here instead of just having one clutch as you pop or actually have to regulate the one clutch paddle. So these are programmable. We can make these a button too, and we can make it an analog. So it can do like throttle on one, brake on the other. So you can drive with no pedals if you want to, or if you need to. So yeah, overall, you know, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about this. I can't really see anything that stands out at all. I mean, like I said, it's kind of a professionally finished product right out of the box. So again, Moza does a good job with this stuff as far as presentation, right up there with the best in the sim racing manufacturing, the mass manufacturing companies. So yeah, what else we get? You get your manual, you get a sheet of stickers. I never use these things, but there they are. And you can see some of them are shaped a little differently than others because of the buttons and rotaries that we can use them around. They have different shapes to them, so that's why they're shaped differently. Again, I just never really use those things, but each his own, right? We also have some spacers. Now, this is a GT wheel, and the reach is pretty good for me. It feels good. But for somebody with longer fingers or bigger hands, it might be too short. Get cramped in here with their big mug hand it's sitting in here, and knuckles are hitting it. So what you can do is, there's two things you can do. You take the two screws out, and it's hard to show the screws. You can see them hiding down in there, I think. So we take these out and we can take the paddles and just put them on the other side. Now these are not countersunk holes on here, so it doesn't matter as far as the orientation of the paddle. We have to flip it with the other one to get the flat side lined up like it should be. So you can just take it off and put it on the back and then reattach it. And that'll give you, looks to be about three millimeters worth, maybe four of more reach this way. And if that's not enough, they give you some spacers in here. These are 10 millimeter spacers, two holes in them. And of course, what we would do is put this in between the paddle itself back here, and then the paddle would sit on that side of it. So you get even more reach, another 10 millimeters of reach that way. So bigger hand guys will appreciate that. So it backs these paddles off away from your hand and easier probably for them to use. And of course they have four of them so that everything lines up properly. If you move the shifter, you're gonna to wanna to move the clutch, or maybe you don't. Depends on what you want to do. You can mix and match, I suppose. Now, also, with the clicking, it is kind of loud. I don't have any problems with that here at the SRG, but there's a lot of people who race at home or in their garage with, uh, you know, closets, whatever. <laughs> it might be somebody close by that doesn't want to hear this constant clicking going on. So they give you these rubber bumpers and a wrench. It's a two millimeter wrench. So if you have another two mil, you can use that. And these are these little rubber pads in here. See how they're segmented? So you can peel one off and give you enough. One, two, three, they give you five. So if you mess one up, you got an extra one. And you would put these in the bottom of this piece here of the shifter housing. Turn it around this way. So where the magnet is on this side, you wanna get underneath there and put them in there. So the return snap will be muted. It won't sound like that. It will have this part to it though. But overall, it's going to be muted. It's not going to be as irritating. So it's nice that they actually think about that, that people complain about magnetic shifters because of the noise, but we love them because of the feel. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you're always a compromise, right? So yeah, that's it. That's everything that comes with it. We're going to go ahead and get the motor attached, get the wheel set up and pull up the software and see what we can do as far as programming buttons and things like that. So let's take a look inside of this RS version two wheel from the guys at Moza. We'll take a look at the back housing casement first. This looks to be a cast unit. Doesn't look like or feel like to me that it 
is a CNC machine unit, which is consistent with what I've seen so far. We do have some rather beefy standoffs here for support. And of course we run these bolts through here to connect to the back of our quick release. You can see the other side of that or the inside of that where the electrical connection is. We've got some, how many wires are these? Six? Yeah. So we've got some six lead wires in here with Molex plugs on them. And of course they're servicing the pods back here that have our clutch handles and our shifters. They're attached by two bolts on the top and the bottom or screws. A little bit small to be called bolts, I guess. And some hot glue to keep things from getting out of hand. And it looks like a little bit of electrical tape on there also. Yeah, pretty clean. This is the plastic window. Now this is actually sticky. Go ahead and turn this around. You can see how much bigger it is on that side. But the real space is right there. And of course that's where the transceiver for the wireless communication is located on the circuit board. We'll see that in a minute anyway. But yeah, a little bit sticky in there. I was assumed that that would not be sticky, but yeah, it's not going to hurt anything. Of course we have the venting holes here. But on the version 2, we don't have the wireless transceiver sitting up in these holes. It's down here, obviously, where this plastic is. Well, let's take a look at this. This is the forged carbon fiber piece on the front. And it's about 2 millimeters thick. Of course, it's just a beauty ring, if anything. I do like the way this looks when it turns in the light, that 3D effect. And of course, it does the exact same thing on the back. All right, so let's look at the circuit board. And that's the front, obviously. And you can see on the front of the circuit board, we've got some capacitors here. These are 25 volt capacitors, 330 microfarads. Of course, that's part of the power circuit in here. We have an inductor sitting over here. And of course, the power comes into this Molex plug here, and that would be plugging into the quick release itself that has the pins on it over here. Clean looking board. We don't have any complaints. This is Consistent with what I've seen so far from Moza, well put together. Again, our wireless transceiver is down here. And there are no other cables coming from it, like some of the other earlier wheels I saw from Moza. Yeah, another cable coming from it in another access place for the antenna to be sitting inside of the wheel, in another plastic window on it. And this was actually sitting up higher so that it could get through, as we saw before, the holes, right? So that's how it communicated. But now they've gone a different route. So this is sitting down here, and our housing will be sitting with that little plastic window there. It's sticky, like this, so you can see how they match up there, yeah? Yeah, you can see down inside here, not much to really see because it's all uh, through mount for the controls themselves. You can see these little pads here, little pins sticking through them. They've been cut back off, and these are the LEDs. Now on the FSR wheel, when I had that apart, they actually had some black tape wrapped around here. I don't know if it was because of the display was right under it or not, but here we have just some plastic pieces there that keep the light inside of this chamber so it doesn't bleed out and lose intensity. That's why these lights are so bright when we're using them. Of course, you can tone that down in the software if that's what you want to do. But yeah, not much else to see here. Just well done, professional looking layout. Just like all the Moses stuff I've seen so far. Right up there with the best of the mass manufacturers of sim racing equipment, I think. Yeah, I guess that's it. So what we'll do is go ahead and get to the... Well, before we do that, might as well look at the weed rim itself. Yeah, let's do that. 330 millimeter. And now that it's off, we can see some of the grooves a little better over here. It's got a little bit of a dish to it. Not much. I don't know if you can see that, see how it's sitting down there. But it's not really a dish, it's more just of an offset of the wheel, steering wheel, because this piece is flat. So if it went this way, you could see it sticking up a little higher compared to this way. You know, this wheel feels pretty good when I was using it. I really don't have any complaints about the grip. They've done a good job here. Leather is not my first choice personally, but yeah, I can see where it would be very functional for a lot of people out there, a lot of racers. There's a little bit of a silver wear mark there on the aluminum piece here. I'm not sure where that came from. 
but it was it's obviously going to be sitting on this plate here on the front. I don't see anything that would gall it like that. Nope. But you can't see it anyway once it's attached to the wheel, so I guess it's kind of irrelevant. But yeah, I like to show everything that I can see when I'm going through this stuff. Right, so I guess that's it. We'll go ahead and get to the next segment. So we're in the Moza Pithouse software. This is 1.2.0.69. I'm just going to briefly go over what we can do with this wheel in here. You can see the icon up here for the wheel is the older RS. It's not the RS version 2, so they just don't have that updated, I guess. But we'll go over and look at what we can do here. The clutch paddles, we have dual clutch paddles over here on both sides, as you saw before in the closer look. Now, right now, they're in axis combined, which I would use those for a dual clutch mode. In other words, I would pull them both in. I would let the right one snap out to my bite point so it doesn't spin the wheel, but it does get the car moving. And you can see the paddles turn a kind of a faded yellow. They're still there. I don't know if you can see them in the video. But then you modulate the left one as I'm letting it out slowly. And once it reaches the end of its stroke, it will show the paddles again. And actually that yellow gets lighter and lighter. You're not going to be able to see it though. I think in the video it's just too pale. But we'll see. All right. So we can also go to axis split, which is nice because each one of these paddles becomes its own axis, analog axis. So we can use one side for like a throttle, other side for a brake, something like that, if you need that, or do something else with it if you want to. And we got button mode, which means we can map the clutch paddles to a button. Just by pressing the paddle, it'll be a button then. I'm going to leave it on axis combine. Stick mode. The sticks are these guys up here, also known as rockers. They call them rockers too. And they have a little drop down here explaining some things that these do. This is the left clutch paddle plus... The menu rocker gives us 360 degree steering angle. So we can go from 360 to 900 on the fly by just holding the left clutch paddle and pushing a button. So let's see if that works. We're going to need to go over here where we have steering angle. Right now I'm at 900. I'm going to pull the left clutch paddle in. You should be able to do this on the fly for whatever reason if you need to. And I'm going to press one of the encoders on the right side. And that, does uh, that change anything? All right, let me try the top one. Yeah, okay, 540. I must have been already in 900 on the right one. So we'll go over here to the other left side rocker. 360, the left side encoder gives me 720. Okay, yeah, we were already on 900. All right, so you can do that on the fly. Let's go back. And you can also use D-pad mode over here for the stick. Engine RPM indicator mode. I'll use this. I'll usually leave this on the default RPM indicator mode one, unless I have a reason to change it. And really the only reason I would change this is because it's too slow or it's too fast on the shift points. So it's shifting before I get the flashing shift point on the actual LED on the wheel. And if it's too slow, then I will say, okay, lead, go faster. In other words, it'll do it quicker. And if that doesn't work, then I can go late if it's too late or just go to custom. Then you can dial these in any way you want to so that it matches exactly where your shift points are, the RPMs that you want it to be. And you can change the colors over here if you like. And we have the brightness setting. I'm going to go ahead and turn that up all the way. <laughs> and I'll put that on 100. So that's really the only controls we have for this. All right. So not a lot to look at here as far as this goes. Now, we'll show you one thing before I go here and move on to getting to driving. Is you have to hold these two encoder buttons down until this is flashing yellow or it's kind of a yellowish green. I'm going to show you that right now. I'm going to go ahead and push them down. As soon as it starts flashing, I'm letting go. This puts you in program mode for the colors on your buttons. These LEDs will change colors. So I got the red one up here. If I press that once, it changes to a kind of a yellow, kind of a pale yellow. And then it goes to like a greenish yellow with my same one that the PL is on. And I can just keep pushing this. It'll go through the different greens. Then we got a blue. Then we got a purple. We got a darker purple. Got a white. Then we go back to red. So it cycles through all those. So once you get the buttons where you want them to be, I'm just going to kind of mess around here real quick. Give me that blue one. Where's the blue? There it is. Yellows, greens. Okay. So then I'm done, right? So I'll just go back and do the same thing I did before. Hold these two encoder buttons down until it flashes. Let go. And now you can come in and push the buttons all you want to, and they won't change colors. Pretty simple, huh? So that's about it as far as the functionality of this wheel. And what we'll do next is just, yeah, just get in and start driving and see what we think. We're in iRacing in the Ferrari 488 GT3 Legacy car. And this is Sebring. 
All right, so really there's not a lot of complications to this particular steering wheel. Basically a button plate with an LED readout. The LED did match the Ferrari right out of the box really well. I didn't have to make any adjustments in the software, although that facility is there as we saw before, if you need to do that. The wheel itself, as far as the rim goes, the leather wrap is good. I couldn't find any defects in the stitching or anything and it felt good in hand. I'm not too hard, not too soft. And of course, this is very subjective, so some people might think differently of it, but I didn't have any problems with it. And the little notches in the back of the steering wheel we saw in the closer look, they kind of fit your fingers or guide your fingers around it into the nine o'clock, three o'clock position, which I prefer to drive at. And yeah, so comfortable. I didn't find any fatiguing traits or characteristics with it on longer stints, so I can't complain about the rim at all. The wheel itself, as far as the buttons go, Nothing to write home about as far as the type of feedback you get from these buttons, but they do work nonetheless without any issues. I didn't have any buttons pressed that didn't work. The encoder's the same deal. Of course, we have a push button on these encoders also. Everything worked as it should. I do like the encoders, as I said in the closer look. The spacing seems to be right for me, and the detents have enough stiffness to them or resistance that makes it easy to distinguish between one, two, or three selections when you turn one of these rotaries. So yeah. It, right down my alley as far as rotaries are concerned. The shifters on the back, very crisp, good tactile feel to them. I will characterize them as on the lighter side of the shifting. So definitely will never fatigue you using these shifters, no matter how long you're using the wheel. I'd like something a little bit stiffer. And again, we're getting to personal preference here, but yeah, they get the job done. They're not that loud and they do have rubbers in the kit also that if you want to quiet them down, you can. The clutch paddles, again, the spring tension felt right to me. I don't have any complaints about that. They just got this, this package dialed in pretty well here from my point of view, obviously, which again is very subjective from person to person. But I didn't have any problems with this wheel. I looked for things that I could pick on to you know, say, well, they could have done better with this or better with that. But they pretty much got the new version two dialed in with any of the complaints that I may have had for the original R2 wheel that they have here. So yeah, I, I really can't find anything. I've tried to find anything that I can say, hey, look at this, you know, this doesn't look right. Even the internals, the electrical circuit board layout, everything, it works well. And of course the new location of the transmitter, um, never had a problem with the communication as far as data back and forth between the wheel and the wheel base itself. And I guess really at the end of the day, you can't ask for much more than that. I think really the difference here in this wheel between the version one and version two is how they've done the wireless location on the transmitters now behind a plastic window instead of up by the holes where it was on the first version. And also we have more pins in the connector or the wheel side connector that goes onto the wheel side hub so it can pull more power for whatever they might need it. But I think that's just the standard pin layout they're going to have on all their steering wheels moving forward from this date. So yeah, just gets the job done. Not too many frills here, but a good solid wheel. Final thoughts on the RS version 2 wheel from the guys at Moza Racing. Out of the box, this wheel presents as a professionally built unit. This RS has a smooth leather grip on the rim. It felt good in hand and I could find no flaws in the stitching runs. I did find a wear mark on one of the aluminum spokes located on the side that contacts the carbon fiber plate. The front cover plate and button plate are made from forged carbon fiber, which gives it a three-dimensional look under the lights. This new RS has the same button layout as the version 1 had. The changes come from the new backlit push buttons and a different knob design for the rotaries. The buttons don't have a distinctive tactile feel to them when you actioned until you hit the stops. Still, they did get the job done without any issues during my time with the RS. I do like the way you can change the color of the buttons individually with up to nine different colors. The front rotaries have a proper detent spacing and resistance to make it easy to select the number of clicks you want without over or under shooting when actioned. 
They also have a push button function. There are two five-way rockers on this RS, just like the first version. Both the rockers and the rotaries are programmable in the Moza Pithouse software application, where you can also set other features depending on the wheel you are using. The shifters also have the forged carbon on their paddles. There is a good tactile feel from the shifters when actioned. A bit light for my personal taste, but others might think they are perfect. They do make a loud clicking noise when actioned, as most magnetic shifters do. Moza does include a set of self-stick rubber dampers to mitigate the noise if you have the need. The clutches are spring-tensioned and feel about right for my needs. Not so soft that you don't get a good feel for their throw, and not too hard where it is difficult to smoothly modulate them. The paddles all use contactless hall sensor designs, which should give a good life cycle. On the look inside, we saw a professional-looking circuit board that has a clean layout. The last change I notice is there are now six more contact pins in the quick release hub than before. The previously reviewed Moza FSR formula wheel was where I first saw this, so it seems that this will be the standard moving forward. I had no issues with the controls or wheel comfort during my longer driving sessions with the new RS wheel, which is really no surprise as Moza decided to not mess with success here and added only some changes to it compared to the first version. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.